So hello everyone <laughs> um, and welcome to our latest read along for the Romantic, Romancing the Gothic series. So this week we're going to be talking about religion and the Gothic and the title of the session is um, Who Will Rid Me of This Troublesome Priest? Gothic Faith and Religious Monstrosity. And I was having a think about what texts I could read to you this week and nothing came to mind that was really ideal, that was a, a short poem or short story that I could use. And so I've decided to do something a bit different this week and we're going to read a novel. So every day we're going to be reading a little different section of the novel. Um, and hopefully by Saturday, if I have enough time, we will have finished the whole book. So I've chosen a novel that very few of you will probably have access to. It's called The Libertines and was written in 1798 and published anonymously. I've also picked it because it's quite a good demonstration of a lot of the tropes relating to monstrous religion in the early British Gothic. So some of you, if you're familiar with the early British Gothic, will have read those quite scathing journal or newspaper articles which talk about a, a Gothic recipe, just throw in a monk, throw in a castle, and Bob's your uncle, you've got a Gothic book. And you'll have read Lewis or Radcliffe or Dacca, uh, Godwin, and have thought, well, that's not really very fair, these are quite good. Um, th those sort of descriptions were written about the kind of book that we're going to be reading today. <laughs> because this author is definitely trying to stuff in every possible trope into as short a space of time as possible. So hopefully you'll enjoy that with me. Um, <laughs> maybe not. I'm going to read a couple of chapters. Um, I'm also going to read the preface to the novel because it, it gives you a sort of idea about the anti-Catholic sentiment, but also not only anti-Catholic sentiment. You're going to be finding in this novel, and we'll, we'll unpick it a little bit, there's a sort of anti-extreme religion and anti-superstition and anti-hierarchical religious systems issue going on here. But that introduction introduces this anti-Catholicism, anti-superstition quite vividly for us. So hopefully you'll enjoy the reading and I'm going to start. So the preface. The design of writing a novel on the following subject first occurred to the author on reading various accounts of the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions. The cruelties practiced by these tribunals will scarcely be credited by such as have not made, the subject of, not made them the subject of their inquiry and can only be equaled by the debaucheries of their principal administrators. Under the mask of religion, vices of the most gigantic size have been perpetrated, every social affection interrupted, every moral distinction destroyed. To such as think these pages too highly coloured or that they carry an air of improbability, the author begs leave to suggest that for the principal history, he is indebted to a fact well authenticated and which he first read in an old French pamphlet. A more modern instance, however, of the horrid cruelty practiced by the Inquisition occurred in the case of Mr. Martin, an English gentleman who was imprisoned there in the year 1714 but who was almost miraculously delivered and publicly exposed its enormities. Some remarkable particulars relative to this infernal inquisition may also be read in Mr. Robinson's ecclesiastical researches. Mr. Howard, when he visited the prisons at Valladolid, so late as 1784, observes the very sight of the inquisition struck terror in the common people as they passed it. It is indeed admitted that the violence of this iniquitous tribunal is considerably abated. Its very existence, however, is an evil of magnitude. With respect to the author's general observations on hypocrisy, they will be found applicable to more characters than Spanish and Portuguese inquisitors. In describing the profligate manners of the principal actors in the following drama, to use strong language was unavoidable, but it is hoped nothing will occur that can offend the ear of female delicacy. The wrongs of the fair sex, as more particularly countenanced by the popish religion, being his greatest abhorrence, and to administer to their pleasure his highest ambition. This book may probably, in the opinion of many, bear some analogy in different scenes and passages to Mr. Lewis's celebrated novel of the monk. The author can only say that his system was laid down and two thirds of the book written before the monk made its appearance. 
chapter one. So I'm, I'm also going to be reading the epigraphs to you. So the first epigraph is from Dyer's Ode to Piety, oh, to Pity. Hence, motley mirth and wanton song that frolic in airy mood along, too wrapped in bliss to hear a sigh. Hence, too, with these self-soothing ease that seest to tear unmoved and passeth silent by. Alexo was carefully instructed by his uncle to revere the Catholic religion. And the desire he felt at being witness to the splendid processions of the convents on festivals gave his uncle great hopes that he should one day be able to immure him in a monastery and by that means totally deprive him of all intercourse with the world. He lavished the highest encomiums on the munificence of the church and its members, expostulated with Alexo upon its riches and involved in his arguments that certainty of salvation for those who become God's agent for the administration of his blessings on earth. The poor, said he, receive alms and comfort from the institution, and the rich unbounded satisfaction from the pious exhortations of its members. It is not then more consistent, is it not then more consistent with reason to obey the dictates of the heart and sacrifice our reputation and lives at the shrine of intemperance? The midnight riot may command from the influence of wine a temporary pleasure, but a comfort of lasting effect is found only by the rational few that follow the dictates of morality and religion. This subtle argument produced the desired effect, and the young Alexo was initiated into the convent of St. Dominic in the prime of life and the meridian of gaiety and dissipation. Father St. Francis, a man esteemed universally for his benevolence and piety, was chosen the preceptor of our young friar. He exerted every principle of instruction to instill into his mind the moral obligations of men set apart from society for virtuous dispensations and the promulgation of religious tenets. He also every evening read him lectures in his cell upon abstinence and recommended the voluntary penance of the body to quiet the torments of conscience. After having taught him the necessary lesson of obedience to the worm-eaten relics of different saints and given him a rigid disgust at fleshly gratifications, he left him to fulfill the necessary functions of his office as junior friar of the convent. If the feelings of a man at 21 can ever be overcome by the rigid and ridiculous rules of a monastic life, I am sorry to say our young friar at least was not so happy as to effect it. He could not extricate himself from the fetters of nature and an education fitted for the world. He would often lament his solitary situation and throw his crucifix on the ground in the height of anger and despair. In his cell was a beautiful painting of the Virgin Mary, but the skill of the artist was lost and adoration forgotten when he sighed at midnight for the gay companions of those hours once devoted to mirth and dissipation. One evening, as he mused in the solitary walks of the convent garden, he cursed the hour of his initiation and broke into vehement and loud exclamations upon the frailty of human nature and the venality of his professional confederates. Why did I listen? said he, to the artful dissembling advice of Rodrigo. Why did I so precipitately leave the seat of pleasure and luxury for the abominable clothing and the food of superstition? I will, I am resolved. At that moment, he discovered a friar musing in a walk overarched with high trees that led to a hermitage at the bottom of the garden. Apprehending he had overheard his exclamations, he retreated through the shrubbery into an adjoining romantic arbor, and there secreted himself amidst the low shrubs that surrounded the spot from the prying eye of curiosity. It was the eve of St. Mark, and the day had been kept as a public festival and solemn confession by the monks. He suffered the hour of midnight to approach before he ventured from his hiding place, and having smothered his face in his cowl, proceeded hastily to his cell. As he passed through the cloisters that led to the western door of the chapel, he discovered two men in an avenue adjoining in private conference and listened attentively to their conversation. They appeared from their gestures to be discussing a subject of momentous consequence. This determined Alexo to know the result of their conference. He therefore managed to get as near them as possible without being detected, and his astonishment was beyond conception when he heard the crime of murder defended by the oldest friar of the two in the most horrid and sanguinary terms. Murder? said the monk, may be committed with, <laughs> sorry, may be committed with propriety, 
when the moral character of the perpetrator is hazarded by the existence of the person possessed of a secret, the disclosure of which must inevitably be his ruin. A sigh proceeded from the other fri friar, accompanied with these words. Alas, my brother, how shall we reconcile our minds? The reflection of the many happy hours we have spent in the company of the unhappy and unfortunate Amantha. Oh God, I should never rest after such an act of horrid and deliberate barbarity. You surely cannot justify such a proceeding. Amantha has not injured us. True, exclaimed the grey-headed hypocrite. But has she not exposed the Lady Abbess to insult and contempt? Her to whom I am devoted by the ties of unbounded affection. She shall die tonight. Hold, hold, Father Jerome, said to Caris. Be not too precipitate. You may repent this temerity. Let us think of some way to dispose of her, less violent and impious than murder. Away then, exclaimed Jerome. Away to your cell and brood over the childish fears that would keep you from an act commanded by our religion and the laws of self-defence. Hence, hence, and remember that although you may not assist in the execution of the deed, you will answer for acts of disaffection to our order. The good character you now command in the convent will avail but little, for I will blast it with the force of my authority, and you shall suffer the punishment due to your cowardice. Here they separated. When Jerome suddenly turned to Paul de Carras, the other monk, and again demanded his presence at the bloody act. He consented, but apparently under the impression of terror and the feelings of guilt. They proceeded with caution down an avenue in the garden and passed through a private archway that led into the burying ground of the convent. Alexo listened with anxiety near the spot for some time, but no sound of any kind was heard. Tired with fruitless watching, he was about to depart when he heard footsteps approaching. He immediately secreted himself near a ruin, from which he perceived the friar's advance, escorting a nun who was clad in a deep black veil. His mind was now strongly impressed with the piercing sensation of horror. The moon was sunk into the bosom of a dark cloud in silence, as in death, reigned in every part of the solitude. And as he followed the friars through the gloomy walks of the garden, the sighs of the unfortunate female only were heard to mingle with the moaning of the night wind as it swept along the avenues. After some time, they arrived at a private door which led into the chapel and which was open. The surprise of the friars at this unusual circumstance was beyond expression. They deliberated upon the consequences of entering the sanctuary in the presence of the person whom they supposed was at prayers. It was therefore determined that one should proceed and examine the chapel, whilst the other remained at the outer door. Precious moments, said Alexo. Why should I hesitate to, sell, to fell this villain to the earth and rescue from certain death this innocent and friendless victim? Will God forgive the act? I have been taught to love him for his goodness, to acknowledge his forgiveness to a repentant sinner. Why then should I doubt of his mercy for a deed of justice? Yes, he shall die. And quickening his pace to where the friar stood, he had nearly gained the spot unobserved when Jerome came from the chapel and reported to his fellow that no person was there, and he suspected the porter had unintentionally forgot to lock the door. Alexo, hearing this, contrived to get into the chapel, whilst the friars were busied in satisfying their suspicion by searching the adjoining avenues and places likely for concealment. The aisles were dark and solitary, which obliged Alexo to be careful in picking his way, lest he should be heard by the friars who were approaching. He secreted himself behind a tomb until they had nearly reached the top of the middle aisle, when he perceived them go up to a small altar that stood in a remote niche of the Gothic structure and kneel down before it. After muttering a few incoherent prayers, they took the female by the arm and commanded her to kneel before the altar. She obeyed. They then ordered her to kiss her Agnes Day and pray for a remission of her sins, for that in a few moments she would be no more. Sighs and tears, accompanied with the most pathetic entreaties, were the consequence of this order. She conjured them by their faith and love of Almighty God to spare her, for she was innocent of any crime they had to charge her with. Horrid idea, cried Jerome. Thou knowest that the order would condemn us to the severest punishment, and the Lady Abbess to death for violating the sacred laws of the institution. 
in suffering you to escape punishment merely for requesting it. No, no. Thou must. Nay, thou canst not live. Remember, said she, the professions you made when first I devoted my personal influence to your solicitations. Remember, when in religious conversation, how often you have stored, restored my heart with the principle of mercy and taught me to revere benevolence as the dawn of heaven on the mind. Spare me, spare me. And whilst you brood over the consequences of a discovery, allow my innocence for an acquittal. Reflect upon the act you are about to commit, a deed of murder, a crime that can never be pardoned. Here she took a miniature painting from her bosom and pressing it to her lips, shed over it a thousand affectionate tears. A clock was indistinctly heard in the distant turret. Time passes, exclaimed Jerome, and morning will appear before we can conceal the body. He drew the dagger from his belt and raised his arm to plunge it in her bosom, but Alexo groaned in the most terrific manner. The friar hesitated. Are we not alone? said Jerome. I carefully surveyed the chapel and found it totally free from human beings. That noise, replied de Carus, must proceed from the spirit of some injured and avenging saint whose name we have so prof repeatedly profaned by using it in the prayers we're now on the point of violating with the most deliberate act of barbarity. Idle thought, exclaimed Jerome. The disquietudes of the dead arise not from humane regard to the living, but from the souls enduring the pains of purgatory for some atrocious deed committed whilst in existence. The earth hides their bones and repetition of mass for the repose of the spirit every evening surely must be sufficient. Oh, these are the dreams of imagination, the visionary effects of superstitious fear. It was the hollow wind among the tombs. We will proceed. Again, Alexo performed the office of a supernatural being with sighs and groans. I am convinced, said Jerome, some prying fiend has secreted himself in the church. I will examine it. If he be mortal, death shall be the atonement of his curiosity. If supernatural, it is the business of fools and children only to be alarmed at a passing shadow. He advanced so quick to the place of Alexo's concealment that he had not time to escape and fell into the friar's hands. Ha! Villain! exclaimed Jerome. Art thou the suspected spirit? <laughs> Dost thou presume to dispense the untimely warnings of the dead? Take the reward of your treachery. He aimed a blow at Alexo with the dagger but fortunately it only penetrated the sleeve of his habit. This circumstance allowed Alexo time to recover himself and seizing the friar by the throat, he threw him on the ground. During the scuffle, the Carus conveyed the lady from the church to his cell. and On his return, he found Alexo had overpowered his antagonist who was begging for mercy on the ground. Take it, cried Alexo. Take that which you, most, which you this moment denied to the unfortunate victim of your cruelty. Execrable old man, let the future hours of your life be devoted to penitence and contrition. He hurried to the altar, but perceiving that Decaris had decamped with Amantha, was about to leave the chapel in search of her when the friar appeared and demanded the reason of his conduct. This church, said the monk, is a sanctuary, the house of God, a place consecrated to devotion, and not for a display of our criminal passions in acts of blood. Detested hypocrite, exclaimed Alexo. I will unmask you to the world. The Church of Rome is no more than a consecrated asylum for the promoters of vice and murder, but the Holy Inquisition shall reward you. Hold, said Decarus, rash and temperate youth. Reflect upon the consequences that must inevitably result from such conduct. The Holy Inquisition is a tribunal of opinion and regards the order of St. Dominic too much to interfere with its members on the tail of a distempered brain. Your folly will be rewarded with an exemplary punishment. Know that Jerome is one of the secret council of reference. I warn you of the danger that threatens you. The punishments are dreadful. Go to your cell and attend to the duties of your profession, otherwise you will repent it. Alexo was sensible of nothing but the effects of rage and disappointment, and rushing from the church, fled to his cell under an anxiety of mind scarce to be described. After prayers in the morning, he retired into the solitudes of the garden, and deliberated on the best means to quit the convent. His own personal safety required such a step, 
and the desire of bringing to light the conduct of the friars determined him to effect his escape from an order supported by the fraud of religious villains. Is it thus, he exclaimed, that villainy, cloaking itself in the garb of religion, imposes upon the world? Damn deceitful mercenaries! The public robber, robber comparatively commands respect. His daring spirit of enterprise and his crimes are the effects of, of poverty and distress. But when the ministers of our church, these reputed bulwarks of the Catholic faith, perpetuate crimes too sanguinary for a, sarid, for a savage, these creatures of bigotry and indolence are justly execrated and, ab and abhorred by mankind. His mind was deeply impressed by these reflections, and retiring to his cell, he wrote a letter to Francis, detailing the circumstances he was witness to in the church, and declared his intention of secretly withdrawing himself from the abbey. In the evening, he quitted the convent under the pretense of administering supreme unction to a dying man in the neighbourhood. Upon the gate closing, he offered up a prayer of thanksgiving for his liberty. He immediately went to the shop of a broker that he formerly knew, and alleging that he had been at a masquerade, desired that he would wait upon him with a change of dress at a small inn over the way. The honest trader was soon announced, and the business completed. Being equipped in a plain suit of black, he went in search of his uncle. He rapped at the door, but was surprised to find his house occupied by an honest, painstaking tailor, who had retired from the labours of the needle and lived upon the fruits of his industry. This man assured him that his uncle was no longer inhabitant of Madrid, but that from some suspicious circumstance, he knew not what, neither did he pretend to say, Rodrigo had quitted the kingdom of Spain for that of Portugal. Struck with astonishment at the tailor's information, he plainly saw the motive that induced Rodrigo to seclude him in a monastery. Fixed in a determination to find out the place of his uncle's retreat, and not having the means of satisfying his travelling expenses into Portugal, he entered himself as a mule driver to a merchant who was on the point of setting out with a train of attendants for a mart in the province of Extremadura. Alexa was miffed at Vespers, missed <laughs> at Vespers, an inquiry being made of the porter by Jerome as to the time of his quitting the convent and the reason he assigned for it, he was convinced of the fraud and proclaimed his conduct to the order. He also accused Alexa of an intention to murder him in the sanctuary of the church, which was confirmed by the testimony of Decarus. After a consultation among the senior friars, Decarus was dispatched to the Inquisition with a formal complaint and an accusation of the pretended crime. A council was immediately summoned and an order issued for the apprehending of Alexo. It described his person so accurately that he could not be mistaken. A, pa a paper of this sort was delivered to the host of the inn where Alexo was waiting to accompany the muleteers. It was circulated among his companions who were carousing by the fire. They eagerly looked at the reward and resolved upon searching for the criminal. Alexo had constantly avoided the company of these men, except when necessity, necessity required him to associate with them. He had often been observed in a retired situation with his arms folded as in deep reflection. This circumstance gave rise to a suspicion that he was the person described in the handbill, and accordingly an aguacil was sent for, and at night he was conveyed to the prison of the Inquisition. He was led through a variety of dark, damp and winding passages to a cell that was dimly lighted by a lamp suspended from the ceiling by an iron chain. His fare was nothing more than the common allowance of the prison. During the hours of his confinement, his conscience afforded him the required consolation under his misfortunes. And when he reflected upon the advice given him by his preceptor, Father Francis, his heart yielded to the sensibility of nature, and a flood of tears succeeded the powerful influence of memory. After he had been confined near a week in this dreadful prison, he was ordered to an audience with the Grand Inquisitor, and at midnight the guards conducted him to a chamber hung with black, where he found an old man sitting between two large silver crucifixes and a secretary at the bottom of a long table. Being seated on a stool, the secretary began the list of accusations. The first was as follows. First accusation. Don Alexo, a junior friar of the Order of St. Dominic, is accused of having violated the laws of the Catholic Church by entering a sanctuary at the dead of night with an intent to murder the second inquisitor of reference. What sayest thou to this charge? asked the inquisitor. I deny it, replied Alexo in a firm and manly tone. The circumstances so directly charged against me are those that affect Jerome, my private accuser. He is the vilest of dissembling wretches and deserves the punishment that he is endeavouring to inflict upon me. I beg leave to submit to your lordship the cause that urged Jerome to commit me to the prison of the Inquisition. 
Alexa then told the whole of the proceedings in the church, the cause of the quarrel, and concluded with accusing Jerome in the face of heaven of an intent to murder the nun. Upon hearing his story, the Inquisitor sat for some time musing in his chair when he ordered him back to his dungeon. Several days passed with no other comfort than what arose from conscious innocence. Justice, he knew, was banished from the abominable tribunal, as the accused was uniformly convicted upon their own extorted confessions. One night, as he was endeavouring to destroy the reptiles that engendered in his dungeon and prevented him from resting quietly, he found a board under his bed that was loose. He listened. The footsteps of the sentinels, as they paced along the passages, only disturbed the silence of the night. Oh, there is a page jump going on here. Let me just see if I can find the page. On removing it and searching with his hands upon the floor, he found several sheets of paper carefully pinned together, which were deposited near a linen cloth that contained the mouldering fragments of a child. He was seized with a cold shivering on discovering these awful testimonies of cruelty. He returned the cloth as he had found it into the hole and sat down on his bed to peruse the manuscript. It contained the following. History of Donna Cleanthe. One day, as I was drinking tea with my mother in Madrid, Father Jerome of the Dominican convent entered the room and joined us in conversation. He was my mother's confessor, for since the precipitate flight of my father from the malice of his enemies, he appeared to deserve our confidence. But when he retired in the evening, he whispered as he passed me in a kind of insidious manner. We shall soon meet again. This somewhat alarmed me and surprised me, but I took no notice of it to any person. About midnight, there was a loud rap at the door. I started from my bed and desired the servant to inquire who was there. The answer was, the Holy Inquisition. <sighs> These words, my senses forsook me, and I sunk in the arms of my servant. She shrieked as the repeated raps at the door were followed by the threats of the officers. My mother, alarmed by this disturbance at so late an hour, came into my room and learning the cause called from the window for them to depart. A voice, terrific in the extreme, cried out, Force the door! Force the door! It was immediately burst open and four armed ruffians entered my chamber, seized both me and my mother, forced us into a coach and carried us to the prison of the Inquisition. Here, Alexo heard the clanking of chains in the passage. He hastily concealed the papers and expected every moment to be dragged before the Grand Inquisitor. But the noise soon subsided and he resumed the narrative. On entering the dreadful prison, my mother was conducted to a dungeon, and I was led to a most splendid apartment. After passing some time alone in the chamber, a female, apparently a domestic of the prison, entered the room and desired that I would sit down and, and take some refreshment. Chocolate was brought by a person in a mask, and she entreated me to taste it. I refused, and conjured her to tell me the reason of my imprisonment and how long it was to last. Bless me, she cried, imprisonment? Why, my dear creature, this is a palace and not a prison. You're in the chambers of Don Jerome, a friar of St. Dominic and an inquisitor of great note. He is a man universally beloved and possessed of unlimited powers. Don Jerome, I repeated with horrid surprise. Yes, replied Nerissa. Nerissa, Don Jerome. You know him then, madam? Oh, yes. I exclaimed in a torrent of tears. Too well, an abandoned, detestable villain. Hush, hush, she cried. For the sake of Christ and his virgin mother, do not speak so loud. If you do, death will certainly be your fate. Good God, I exclaimed. What do you mean? No, <laughs> my dear madam, she whispered. I will show you all tonight, but pray do as you are bid. Or certain death will be the consequence. I obeyed Nerissa's directions and remained silent until the appointed hour, time for an explanation of her mysterious illusion. The long wished for hour of midnight at length arrived and Nerissa rapped gently at my chamber door. By the light of a small lamp which she carried in her hand, I followed her in perfect silence through a range of dark galleries until we arrived at a small iron door. She opened it with a key that she took from her pocket and we descended a few steps into a room that was hung with black tapestry, descriptive of the punishments of hell as recorded in fabulous history. She then said, 
Here, madam, are the instruments of torture. And holding up the lamp, I discovered a large brass pan over a furnace, on which was the inscription, The Punishment for Heretics and Persons Disobeying the Orders of the Holy Inquisition. In this pan, said she, the poor creatures are locked down, reduced to ashes by a slow fire. We then went into an adjoining room where a horizontal wheel was placed, covered with large, thick boards. She opened a small door at the bottom and bade me look in, when I saw that its whole circumference was armed with sharp razor blades, tender hooks, and bits of old saws. She then led me into another room. Here, she said, is the worst punishment of all. This was a large pit, filled with poisonous reptiles. At the light of the lamp, the snakes erected their crests and hissed aloud in the most terrific manner. They cannot be hungry, she cried, for they had an obstinate lady who would not content to sleep with our superior only last night. At these words, and surrounded by the so many instruments of cruelty, I had fainted, but from the admonitions of Nerissa to support myself until I reached my chamber. As we passed through the gallery, the cries of some unfortunate victim expiring upon the rack reached our ears. The clock told one, and the clank of heavy chains was heard below. Quick, quick, she cried, or we shall be discovered. The noise of footsteps was heard, uh, oh, sorry. The noise of footsteps was heard approaching his dungeon, and Alexa again concealed the narrative. The door soon after opened and a man appeared who desired Alexa would follow him to the audience chamber. When he arrived there, he was astonished to find Jerome, his implacable enemy, seated as inquisitor and Decaris as his secretary at the bottom of the table. He demanded of Alexa why he so daringly added a calumny to a declaration of innocence founded in falsehood. And is my accuser, said he, to sit in judgment upon me? Is this the mode of conducting the trial of an unfortunate man without friends or assistance from the department of the law? I will never at the hazard of my life depart from my resolution of not answering any question put to me by the officers of this tribunal. Son, replied Jerome, you may repent such an inconsiderate vow. When you talk of assistance from the department of the law, I beg leave to say that this most holy institution is not regulated by the law. To suffer a criminal to plead in his defence would be too tedious and incompatible with the, the regular mode of our proceedings. Alexo then launched on out into a strain of violent invective against the Inquisition and all its supporters. He even went so far as to arraign the king at the bar of justice for suffering such hellish torture as to exist. Were I in power, he exclaimed, I would wash away this national calamity, this bloody stain upon the fair records of humanity, this blasphemous cloak of hypocrisy and superstition. Oh God, how long are these enemies to the peace and happiness of mankind to overwhelm the earth with the sacred tears of innocence and virtue? When will the fiery bolts of thy avenging wrath alight upon these gray-headed persecutors? Take him to the rack, cried Jerome, whose eyes and gestures spoke the consummate villainy of his heart. Take him to the rack. Pass on, replied Alexo. Pass on, I'll follow you with the firm reliance that God will revenge my death. As he was retiring between the guards, a sudden confused noise was heard in the audience chamber, and on learning the cause, he found that Jerome had fallen into a violent, convulsive fit. His punishment was therefore of necessity deferred, and he was reconducted to his dungeon. After trimming the lamp and tasting a little water that was in a pitcher on his table, he sat down upon his bed and concluded the narrative. I followed her into my chamber and throwing myself upon a bed, burst into a flood of tears. Nerissa reproved my despair and assured me I should come to no harm if I did not oppose the commands of John Jerome. It was now near the hour of daybreak and a bell in an adjoining room rang with great violence. At this signal, Nerissa instantly disappeared and from a small closet in the room, Don Jerome entered in his slippers and nightgown. <laughs> he fell at my feet and spoke in the most extravagant terms of love and friendship. He declared his passion for me with all the ardour of a young and anxious lover and begged the consummation of his desires that night. My heart was torn with convulsive and agonising throbs. Overwhelmed with horror, I entreated him to abandon so corrupt and wicked a design and leave me to solitude and tears. He flattered me and 
attempted to caress me. I pushed him from me with disdain and laboring under the most violent sensations of disgust and horror, I demanded to know the fate of my mother. He told me she was at liberty, but that I was detained for the purposes he before explained to me. And unless I complied with his request, the most dreadful punishments awaited me. I turned from him with looks of horror, but as he was quitting the apartment, apparently with indignation, I flew after him and endeavoured by my tears and supplications to move him to pity. He looked at me with scornful contempt and, forcing me from him, left me upon the floor in a state of insensibility. When I had in some measure recovered my senses, I rose from the ground and staggered to a chair near the bed, where I indulged myself with the hope that God would extend his merciful protection to the innocent. To describe the situation of my mind during the night is impossible. I can only say that I paced the room in melancholy distress until the approach of midnight. A bell then rang as before. I shuddered until a cold dew overspread every part of me. Nerissa at this moment entered the room. You must go, said she, as she placed her lamp upon the table, immediately to his bed. Never, I exclaimed, maddened with despair. Great God of justice, whither can I fly for safety? I, I am an unoffending victim of oppression to be sacrificed to lust and villainy without thy divine, in, without thy divine interposition. Oh, my beloved Bertram, if some angel could transport thee here for my protection. Nerissa interrupted me and entreated me to obey his mandate. I repeated my vows before a crucifix that stood upon a table in the room. As I rose from kneeling at the cross, a tall man entered the chamber. I shrieked aloud and grasped Nerissa by the arm. He forced us asunder and wrapping me in his cloak instantly conveyed me to the chamber of Jerome. I was followed by two females bearing wax lights and baskets of flowers. Vases of delicate perfumes were burning in the chamber, and a strain of soft music was instantly succeeded by several voices chanting, as I suppose, an epi epithalamium. epithalamium. After insulting me with the sacred appellation of bride, they strewed the flowerets upon the carpet and led me to the bedside. The curtains drew back and the monster appeared, robed as a sultan. He caught me in his arms and the females left the apartment. I shrieked aloud for protection. At that instant... A loud knocking was heard at the great gate of the prison. Lights appeared in the courtyard and soon after the trampling of horses was heard. He rose from his bed and looked out of the window. He returned, apparently engaged in thought. I was instantly ordered back to my room and on my way thither I inquired of Nerissa the reason for Jerome's conduct. There is a great lord brought to the Inquisition by the King's guards, said she. After a few days had elapsed, I was again conducted to his chamber. He loaded me by turns with passionate admiration and inveterate curses, but finding it of no avail to attempt my dishonour by force, he threw me into his dungeon, swearing never to release me until I complied with his desires. Some months after this declaration, he sent for me again. Here the narrative in a different handwriting was concluded, and still resisting his damnable outrages, he, in the height of madness and revenge, drew a dagger from beneath his pillow and plunged it in her heart. The body was thrown into the cellar of this prison to moulder into dust among the many victims to his villainy and oppression. The bones of the child found with this manuscript belonged to Jugurtha, who murdered it privately in this dungeon. For from the letter N appearing at the bottom of the manuscript, Alexo concluded that Nerissa, the domestic mentioned in the tale, was the person who finished the narrative. When Alexo had read this affecting story, he wrapped himself in his cloak and lying down upon his couch wept over the sufferings of the unknown but lamented Cleanthe. After a pause of some minutes he exclaimed, It may be so. It may be suffered to answer some wise and providential end, but when we see from day to day these prosperous miscreants of oppression gathering to themselves wealth and power and fattening upon the superfluous luxuries of the world, whilst the virtuous and friendless part of mankind are the victims of their premeditated plans for debauchery and cruelty, this fact militates against the avowed utility of religion and the common benefit supposed to be derived from the craft of pulpit, de pulpit declamation is nothing more than a delusion to protect them from the suspicions of a discerning age. O oh, Jerome, what an example for mankind dost thou afford, what a living instance of that pitch of depravity which human nature is supposed to be capable of arriving at. What am I to expect from such a bloodthirsty villain? Oh my God, I seem to be deserted by man and thee. His reflections were disturbed by a gentle rap at the door of his dungeon, 
and as he rose from his couch, it opened when Father Francis, his aged and beloved preceptor, entered the room. Mutual sorrow for some time prevented them from speaking. At length, the old man said, I have overheard you, Alexo, and confess myself astonished that a mind like yours should so soon yield to the unmanly dictates of despair. Oh, my son, I conjure you as a father, a friend, to hear me. The Catholic faith... I abjure it, father, exclaimed Alexo vehemently. I abjure it. The principles of what you call the holy Catholic faith are themselves the foundation of our most egregious errors. They infuse into the mind a system of gloomy bigotry and inculcate the horrid and pernicious, pernicious doctrine of persecution. I love the sacred laws of religious toleration. They are too nearly allied to all that is dear to man to be violated by Catholic hypocrisy or the fanaticism of any sect that exists upon the face of the earth. Hush, hush, said Francis. Talk not so loudly and violently about the Catholic Church. The guards listen at the door. By order, when any friend enters a dungeon to speak to the prisoner, I come to release you from this horrid place to conduct you to our convent. Father, I am fixed in my determination never to enter the walls of that detested sanctuary again. The letter I left upon your table and this melancholy tale are my reasons for denying your request. He gave the manuscript to Francis and hid his face in his cloak to hide the sorrows of his heart. When the friar had perused it a little way, his lips were pale. Tears gushed from his eyes as he glared round the room, and when he folded the papers, an involuntary trembling had nearly deprived him of his senses. Gracious heaven, said Alexo, what does this mean? You are unwell, father. He produced the warrant of liberty from the Grand Inquisitor. Accompany me home to the convent, said he. Friar's unaccountable distress struck Alexo with some form of astonishment, and anxious to satisfy himself respecting the cause of it, he hastily concealed the cloth containing the bones of the infant under his cloak, and assisted his deliverer from the gloomy and terrific dungeons of the Inquisition to the convent of St. Dominic.